whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thanksgiving, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to the Jew or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now, as we see here that Paul is ending this discourse here with be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I think some of the Corinthians might have been thinking they're pulling out their hairs because that's what we're trying to do, Paul. But you're sending us mixed messages. It seems like he's sending them mixed messages because they misunderstand the principles from which he derives his Christian conduct and his conduct as an apostle. Because they misunderstand Christian freedom. They misunderstand Christian freedom. We see this because of verse 23 where they declare all things are lawful, all things are lawful. It's no different than saying we are Christians, we're free. Christ has set us free. And so all things are lawful, all things are open to us because we've been set free by the grace of Christ. But then Paul has to add the qualifiers. He says, yes, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Not all things are profitable. And so Christian freedom is governed by two other principles. And the one is profitableness. And the other principle we saw in chapter 6 is the lordship of Christ. Because he said, all things are lawful to, to me, but I will not be enslaved to anything. We also see here in verse 23, he says, not all things build up. And so he says in verse 24, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. The purpose for which we have Christian freedom is not for our self-betterment, our self-improvement, or our own advantage. Why do you have Christian freedom? Why is it that Christ has set you free? Why is it that Christ has saved you? So that you may live as you want? What Paul is contending for here is so that you may be useful for the kingdom. You see, before your salvation, before your salvation, Corinthian church, before your salvation, Christian, today, you were useless to the kingdom of God. Useless in the kingdom because of your sin and brokenness. But the redemption of Christ is to take you from being a sinner, hating God and hating your neighbor, a destructive force in society, in your family, and even to yourself, and transforming you into a useful person, useful for your society, useful for the community that you live in, useful in the church in which you serve, Useful to your family. Useful to your God. Paul could have said this a number of ways. If I highlight the fact like this, Paul could have said, you useless bunch of Corinthians, just be useful. Amen. That's the end of the sermon and he could walk away. But he takes pains to explain this to them. To show them, to take them by the hand and show them your Christian freedom is accomplished for you so that you may be gathered into the flock of God. That you may be built together as the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. He's showing them the glorious purpose for which they were redeemed. What is the glorious purpose that you were redeemed for? 
I've been redeemed by Christ. I can live as I want. If that's the glorious purpose, where do you expect to find Christians who live like that? You expect to find them in the bar. You expect to find them in the theater. You expect to find them on the rugby field cheering their team on. I'm not saying those things are wrong, but I'm saying people who live only for those things are not living for the glory of God. The overarching principle, the overarching goal in the life of the Christian is to live for the God who redeemed you. We're supposed to live for the God who made us, and we don't. We've fallen short of the glory of God. That same God comes and He redeems us so that we may serve and love our Creator, who also happens to be our Redeemer, through Christ Jesus. You see, Christ has reconciled us to our Creator, the Father in Heaven. And so we see the Christian purpose is not to seek your own good, verse 24, but the good of His neighbor. Now, who's your neighbor? Are you only to seek the good of the fellow Christians sitting here with you in church today? Or are you also supposed to seek the good of the neighbor who's just across the border here, just across the street here, and even from your home, living next door to you, the person delivering your mail, the person whom you greet when you go into the doctor's office or the dentist's office or the supermarket. You see, these are some of the problems or some of the challenges that even the Corinthian Christians have to face. How do we behave toward outsiders? How do we behave in our society? How do we behave now that we are Christians? You see, many of these Corinthians were transformed from paganism. And how do pagans worship their gods? It's a constant warfare. Just think about the paganism today. It's a constant warfare. Someone tells you sport is more important. The other one says, no, not sports, but art. And this thing and that thing. And they live for different things and they try and compete. This is the kind of atmosphere going on in the Corinthian church even, or in the Corinthian community, in the Corinthian city. Worship at this temple. No, come and worship at this temple. There are at least eight or nine temples in the Corinthian church that wants people to come and worship at this altar, come and worship at that altar. Christ has come to put a stop to that. There is only one Lord over all things, over all of society, over all peoples, over all of the kingdoms, over all of the nations. His name is Christ Jesus, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. There is no need to go and worship at the various temples for the various gods controlling the various elements in your society. And so Paul here introduces the problem or addresses the problem here of eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. We've already seen him saying not to go eat meat sacrificed to idols in the temples because then you're participating in their worship services. But what Paul is arguing here for in verse 25 when he tells them, eat whatever is sold in the meat market, the Corinthian Christians say, <gasps> He told us not to eat meat sacrificed to idols. He said, yes, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols in the temple where they worship and where they slaughter and where it's part of the sacrifice and where you partake in the feast with them. Don't worship like the pagans worship. But whatever is sold in the meat market and what would happen after these feasts in the temples there would be so much meat left over that it would go to the marketplace and it would be sold at a discount. 
would be sold in the marketplace. But it would have been meat that was slaughtered the day before for the feast for the temple. And so now it's sold. Oh boy, and so when it's sold, you even pay your own money to get this meat. Aren't you worshipping the idol by giving your money, some might say to Paul, to eat that meat that was sacrificed to idols? But Paul here is saying, eat. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. We Christians are not to go around like the Muslims and say, where is the halal certificate? We don't object to buying food or eating food on religious grounds. Why? Verse 26, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. We don't need to institute the Christian board of dietary restrictions. Because our God has already declared all food clean. Christ our Lord has declared all food clean. Where has He done so? Matthew 15 and Mark 7. Matthew 15 from verse 10 to 20 and Mark 7 from verse 14 to 23. Go to Mark 7. Mark 7 and verse 14. Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he has entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. What does Jesus say about Christian dietary laws? All food is clean. All food is clean. This would have been an issue for Jews, for Jewish Christians, because they grew up with Jewish dietary restrictions. Where when they encounter the pagan nations, the pagans eat anything and everything. And so the gospel goes out to the Gentiles and the gospel is the message of the cross where Christ had died for sinners so that they may be reconciled to God. Christ did not die so that Gentiles may eat Jewish dietary law foods. This is what is at stake for Paul and what Jesus had taught his disciples. And what Peter had seen in his vision when the Lord told him, go, kill, and eat. And he said, never. I've never done this, Lord. My conscience was bound. And then Jesus comes and sets his conscience free. What God has declared clean, let no man declare unclean. So why would there be a Christian dietary institute declaring certain foods unclean for the Christian? Now here's a question. Why were there these dietary laws in the Old Testament for the Jews? Hygiene. Hygiene. Go and read the restrictions, what animals you could eat and what you couldn't eat. If you read that list, many of the animals we wouldn't even eat today. The only one that's a little bit debatable is the pig. We eat some bacon now and then without a problem. But many of the animals that were declared unclean were unhygienic animals to eat in the first place. If you were not careful in handling the meat, 
killing and slaughtering the animal, you could get very, very, very sick. And so God has revealed to His people by their dietary laws and restrictions a healthy lifestyle for His people. Now, those things are good. And it's right. Read up on it. But that's not the entry point into the gospel of Christ. Yes, Christ died for your sins so that your whole life may be transformed. But the first thing that needs transformation is not your diet, your heart needs transformation. And so Paul is saying, don't put the cart before the horse. Don't tell the Gentiles they need to transform their diet before you get to tell them they need to trans a transformed heart. Because it's not what they eat that defile them. According to Jesus. It's what comes out of their heart that defile them. Now look at verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 10 and look at verse 27. Paul is here saying on two accounts, eat whatever is sold in the meat market and eat what is, whatever is said before you. So here are two occasions where a Christian in the Corinthian context might encounter meat sacrificed to idols. The first one is in the marketplace when he goes to buy his own meat. Now it applies to us in the same way when you go to buy food. The other day I went to go and buy food and there is a certificate on this food that comes from this place is halal. I'm not buying this food on religious grounds or not, am I? I am going to buy the food. Why? Because of verse 26, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. This food belongs to God. Not the Muslim God, it belongs to the Christian God, it belongs to our God. So I can buy the food freely because the food is provided for by my sovereign God who is over the God of the Muslim. Because the Muslim God is no God. Which idol is anything, Paul says to the Corinthians. Your Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is teaching the Corinthians. And they needed to have this mind shift. Christ is not just one God among many. He is the God over all gods. Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And that is why you behave as a Christian. And live as a Christian. Under that sovereign rule of Christ. That's why you can have confidence and freedom to buy the food in the marketplace. Eat whatever is sold in the marketplace without raising any question on the ground of conscience. So don't let your conscience as a Christian be bound to what you eat and what you shouldn't eat. This is Paul in Colossians as well where he says, Our religion is not one of eat not, taste not, feel not, do not. It's not just a body of law. Christianity is not just a body of law and a body of principles. Yes, there are principles. Yes, there are laws. Yes, there are regulations. But all of them tied all of them tied to the God we serve. Apart from the God we serve, those rules, regulations, mean nothing. Because why are they there in the first place? It's to obey Him. It's to establish how we relate to Him. If you remove the relational aspect of obedience, you end up with legalism. If you remove the relational aspect of obedience and say here is a body of principles to obey, you're busy with legalism. And you've taken people captive for something else. You've not taken them captive for Christ. And so Paul says, you are free to go.
And so, when Paul says here in verse 27, if you, if you are invited, if one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner, you've become a Christian, you've, you've learned of the Christian God, and you've come to the church, and you're growing in the knowledge of Christ, and then your unbelieving friend invites you, you have learned your conscience is not bound to dietary things, and so you're free to eat whatever he sets before you. Whatever he sets before you. What's the practice when people get together and visit one another? I know in our days, some of these principles we don't understand anymore because we have something called uh, bring and share bries. Why do I say that bring and share bries will not help us to understand what's going on here? You see... In the time in which Paul is writing, it's the privilege of the host to supply the food. In the ancient times, and even today to some degree, we bless our friends with fellowship and food and hospitality. Why? Because we show off the blessing of our God. We invite you for dinner. And we put a spread before you and say, whoa, this is rich food. I'm not used to eating such rich food. You say, yeah, I saved it especially for this occasion. To sit before you, to bless you with this. So that you may bless the God who provided, my God who provided this for for us to eat. And so I've invited you. And so it might be strange even to hear Paul saying, eat then whatever is set before you, because if you're invited to the unbeliever's house, what do you think are they communicating? Oh, you poor old Christian. You don't get to eat all this meat in this town because you don't come to the temple. Poor old you, you missed out on the lovely meat at the feast. Come and eat at my home. I'll give you some of the the meat there to eat, you poor old Christian. And then Paul says, eat it. What do you think is going to happen when the Christian eats that meat that was set before by the unbeliever? The unbeliever looks at it and he says, this Christian, he's eating the meat. He wouldn't eat it yesterday, but now it's good enough for him. How come? How come it's now good enough for you? And then what do you think the conversation goes into? When the unbeliever is surprised by the conduct of the Christian, then the Christian gets to say, well, I'm free to eat whatever you set before me because I am free to accept your hospitality even as an unbeliever. We're not Christians sitting in a corner having nothing to do with Gentile unbelievers. I'm free to accept your hospitality. I'm free to eat with you so that I may have a conversation with you. So that I may declare to you the Lordship of Christ over both you and me. I'm here to show you that my God is superior to your God. You think that your God is superior by blessing me as a Christian with food. I acknowledge that this food is my God's food in the first place. I didn't eat it in the temple because you took my God's food and sacrificed it to an idol in the temple. And so God said it's off limits there because I'm not partaking with you in your feasts. But when it comes out, it's still the same food. I haven't partaken with you in the feast. I'm not serving your God. I'm just showing you that my God brought this meat back to me in the first place. The meat that you took from God is the meat that God has now somehow brought back to His people and said, welcome. Opening the house of the unbeliever to the Christian for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of evangelism. When Paul is saying, eat whatever is said before you, some of us might cringe because for me, what if they put banana bread in front of me? What if they put food 
in front of you which you don't like. Well, Paul is only saying to you, you, may, you can eat without raising any question on the ground of conscience. So what that does mean is, you may object in the case of taste. I don't like the taste. You may even object on the basis of your allergies. Sorry, I can't eat this. I'm allergic. And you can even object on the basis of your preference. A Jew can even say something like, no thanks, I don't want the bacon. I'll have this and I'll eat that. No. You're free to accept whatever and reject whatever, but not on religious ground. You don't go sitting there like a pious old Christian and say, I'm not allowed to eat this. Because then you are showing, and this is what Paul is trying to teach the Corinthians, you are then showing that your God is no different than the other idol gods. Because how do these idol worshippers, how do you think parties go at their house? The one worshipping at this temple invites a lot, lot of people from that temple and he sets before them the food and they, he says, look at this nice spread. You can't have any of it because your conscience is bound not to eat any of this stuff. And so we're eating before you to show you our God takes good care of us. And then the next week, they get an invite from their friends from the other temple. And then these guys think, we eat things you can't eat. And it's this battle, back and forth, back and forth. Because we, we're people, we think religion is about what? We think religion is about what we eat, what we drink, what we do, what we don't do, what we smoke, what we don't smoke, where we go, where we don't go. And Paul is saying, when you're in religious conversations, cut through all of that nonsense of external religion. It's external. It has nothing to do with the soul of man and with the heart that needs salvation. People are blowing a smokescreen, in other words with their external religious behavior. I'm okay with God, you see. I go to the temple every Saturday. I'm okay with God. We even do it in the church sometimes. I'm okay because I go to church. If you're merely a Christian in the external things that you do, you need to repent. Because Christianity is not primarily an external religion. It is a transformation of the heart that leads to an external way of life. And so even the gospel, even in evangelism, the focus is not by pressing unbelievers from the outside so that they are transformed on the inside. It is to go and say, there is the problem in your heart. Isn't this what Jesus did to a certain degree with the woman at the well in John chapter 5? He's telling her things about her own life situation, her own heart. That is far removed from God. And her first question is, oh, tell me, where must we worship? The Jews say at the temple. And we say here in this place. You see, tell me how may I organize my external life so that I may be right with God. And Jesus is trying to tell her, it's not about how you organize your external life. Your heart needs to be right with God. Because if you have a transformed heart, you will be useful. You don't go now in unprincipled territory. There are principles, but it's tied to the relation. The relationship that is established and that is corrected. So the primary objective in evangelism is not a change of diet, but a transformed heart. The rest will follow. Eventually. And even if the diet never changes, it's fine. It's fine. Do not put the cart before the horse. Now we see a further hypothetical in verse 28. But if, 
So in this hypothetical situation where you're invited to the house of an unbeliever, the Corinthian Christian, if someone says to you, this has been offered to an idol, why do you think an unbeliever might say, hey, this is offered to you, to an idol? The first question we must ask is, does someone necessarily a unbeliever or could it also be a Christian? There's someone here. If someone says to you, if some Christian tells you or if some unbeliever tells you, Paul is not qualifying here, so it could be both. So you can envision already, it might be an unbeliever telling you this meat is sacrificed to idols and you might even see a Christian telling you this meat is sacrificed to idols. But in both of these cases, what we see is an uninformed person, uninformed about the true nature of the Christian gospel. Because in the mind of either the unbeliever or this Christian, Christians still need to stick to certain dietary laws. And so you can think, it might be the case that you're at the, at the meal, and the unbeliever tells you this food is sacrificed to an idol. Why do you think the unbeliever tells you this? Because he wants to be a good host, maybe. Or a good friend to you. Because he thinks you have a conscientious objection against it. And so he tells you, the, the, this, you, you Christians don't eat pork, right? So I'll, 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 I'll take the bacon this way. Paul says, in that case, do not eat. So abstain. If someone thinks that you as a Christian don't eat pork, if someone is a Christian, if, if you go to a, a braai and they enjoy a glass of wine and you have no objection to taking a glass of wine every now and then when you're with friends, and they say, oh, you're a Christian, you don't drink wine, so I won't pour for you. You don't go say, oh, oh, oh I'll have some. You don't drink. You leave it. If there's a misunderstanding about what your conscience and what your relationship with God is, that's, that's their problem, not yours. And you don't have to sort that out for them. This has been offered to idols in sacrifice. Then Paul says, do not eat for the sake of the one who informed you. For the sake of the one who informed you. So either the Christian or the non-Christian who's informed you, this has been sacrificed to idols, then you don't eat. Because they expect you not to eat. And if you then eat, what happens? They are surprised and shocked. And now you have to deal with the issue why you ate or why you didn't eat. And then it becomes a discussion about external religious matters. But if you let it go, maybe you're able to in the next sentence or two or the next interaction to be more focused on the heart issues of the gospel instead of offending the person who told you, you Christians don't do this, don't. And so Paul says, on two grounds you do not eat, for the sake of the one who informed you and also for the sake of conscience of the one who informed you. He tells you this, the end of verse 28. Then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. And what Paul is saying here is, they have a conscience. Even if it's an unbeliever, he has a conscience to alert you. He's doing it for your best interest. Because he's operating from a different worldview. They operate from a worldview where they think if you even accidentally eat the food of another idol, you've somehow worshipped that idol. And so this unbeliever might be warning you to say, Oh Christian, remain pure. He's encouraging you even. It shows you he has a moral conscience, consciousness, Paul is saying. And for the sake of his moral consciousness, don't offend his moral consciousness. Because he'll need that moral consciousness when you teach him how to obey God. 
Don't go searing that moral consciousness of unbelievers. Encourage that by your own behavior. So be mindful. Oh boy, how different is this teaching then from I'm a Christian, I don't care what anyone thinks. You should care what other people think in the right context. I don't care if you're, when they have an opinion that's different than the opinion of God. But I do care that they have a high opinion of God. You get me? I don't care if, if you set yourself up against God, I'll choose God's opinion above yours any day. Doesn't matter what your opinion is. But if your opinion is one that is neither here nor there, for the sake of introducing you to the God I serve, I won't offend your opinion. In Christian freedom, I don't always have to have my preference, my opinion, my rights being met. Isn't that exactly what we're called to as Christians? Isn't this exactly what we're called to as Christians? To love our neighbor as Christ loved us. How, did, how much did Christ love you? He gave up all of his rights for you. How many of your rights would you be able and willing to give up for the people around you? It's a trouble. It's a problem for today because many people today, most people today stand, I have my rights. Isn't that how we think? So and so must not think they can't do this and this and this and this. You do care what people think. You see? He shouldn't think that. Da, da, da. You're, you're showing exactly that you care what he thinks. Now we enter into a dilemma, a little bit of a dilemma here in verse 29. When Paul says, I, mean, I do not mean your conscience, but his. Then the next half he says, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Now here Paul is speaking about himself. Why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? And so Paul is showing them back to his own situation. Where he has also eaten some meat in the marketplace. And maybe eaten some meat when he's invited to the house of Gentiles. And the reason why the Corinthian church has a problem with Paul the apostle. Because he eats the meat sacrificed to idols. He's no true apostle. And so Paul is back to defending that and he says, For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? And he's saying this on two fronts. Just like when we are limited in the same way and come into the same circumstance. We're limited on two fronts. Because he's just argued for behaving in a certain way based on the conscience of the unbeliever in his home. Or to the one in the meat marketplace who sells the food. And also the conscience of the Christian, the weaker Christian who's uninformed and still thinks Christians don't do this or that. Or even the Jewish Christians who think that you shouldn't eat maybe bacon or something like that. So Paul is saying, why should he behave in a way, he must now make a choice. Whose conscience is he going to offend and which conscience is he going to honor? The conscience of this person or the conscience of that person? Because he's torn in these situations. What do you do in those situations as a Christian? Have you ever been in the situation as a Christian? Where you have to make a choice of behavior or word or speech. And you have two different groups of Christians or two different groups of people. Your own family and your, your church family. Oh, I hope they don't see one another or they don't come together because that puts me in an awkward spot because these people don't believe like these people do and they don't believe like they do. And I'm caught in the middle here because if I behave in a certain way, they think I'm doing it this way and they think this. And, uh, how am I going to manage this? And so Paul is asking the question, why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? And he says here to the one group in verse 30, 
And that's the Christian group who should know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and that Christianity is not about your diet. That the gospel of Christ is not about your diet. He says, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because of that for which I give thanks. So he's asking to some of the Corinthians, why do you denounce me if I eat some of the food that I bought in the marketplace or that I ate in someone's home? Why am I denounced? Because your conscience should be free from these things. Eat, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If I partake with thankfulness, this is the way they would give thanks, by the way. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof would be an acknowledgement before you even eat. I've received this from the hand of the Lord. That's why we bless the food in the first place. Thank you, God, that you have provided for me this food here. By the way, that's a perfectly good lesson to teach your children. Pray before you eat. Why do we pray? They say, don't, we don't know. Okay, then you ask them, who, who, who brought the food here? Their first answer is, Daddy did. I say, no, 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 no. I, I just went and got it from somewhere else. It came from God. We thank God because He gave it to us. He gave it to me to give to you. Thank God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So Paul says, if I partake with thankfulness, if, if the meat comes to me through the invitation or through my money going to, to buy it in the marketplace, I haven't eaten in the temple where I've partaken with demons and have, have, have served or have worshipped with, uh, with other worshippers worshipping idols. If in the everyday life I partake with thankfulness and I thank the Lord for the sustenance which He provides for me, why would you Christians denounce me for that? Why would the Christians denounce me for eating pork? For eating meat that was boiled in milk? Or any such other restriction that was lifted. So why, says Paul, am I limited in the enjoyment of my freedom? And so he's rebuking the Christians, but in verse 31 he says also, So whatever you eat or drink, use that freedom. Use that freedom where you have given thanks to God. And he's giving you four guiding principles in Christian freedom here. And so what he's arguing here for is Christians, acknowledge the freedom that you have in Christ and acknowledge the freedom that your fellow Christians have. And that's what Paul is getting to with the Corinthians. Corinthian Christian, just acknowledge that your fellow brothers and sisters in church with you have the freedom to buy that food. Christians in the church today, just acknowledge that your Christian brothers and sisters have the freedom to buy the halal food without objecting to it. You have the freedom to do it. Yes, that money goes to Islam, but somehow God will care that that money comes back to the Christians. Our God is a sovereign God over all things. Even if the money is in the pocket of the unbeliever, it's still God's money. Even if all the resources on this earth is split between a handful of people or one percent of people, of which the richest man in the world, an immoral young genius, whatever, he thinks he's great. Even that, even his assets and riches is not his. It's God's. It's God's. And so do with the stewardship what God has called you to do with what he has given you. He's not given you what he's given that, that rich man. He's given you less. What do you do with the little that God has given you? Do you use it for fruitfulness? You see, again, Christian freedom is for fruitfulness, for usefulness. Trading up. So here's the four guiding principles from verse 31 to verse 33. The first guiding principle in your Christian freedom is 
Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. So you find it difficult. I have Christian freedom. I can go drink. I'll get drunk to the glory. Oh, no. Sorry, I can't. I can't get drunk to the glory of God. That, that doesn't work. You see? That will keep you from many dangers. I'm going to go visit that sick person in hospital to the glory of God. Yes, that sounds right. That sounds like something that will glorify God. To go visit the sick. I'm going to refuse to help. No, no. Can't do that to the glory of God. I can offer my help or my services here to the glory of God. Yes, that I can do. I refuse to forgive my... To the, no, can't work. I can't refuse to forgive to the glory of God. I can't. Isn't that very helpful to know? Because you see, then you'll quickly see the principles are derived from your relationship with the one true God who redeemed you. Do all to the glory of God. So the first commandment here, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You have freedom to do that. Secondly, verse 32, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. So the second principle is give no offense. This corresponds to the second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't like it when people come in your face being arrogant all of the time, trying to show you how wonderful they are. Why would you do that with other people? To go and show them how wonderful you are. If it's unacceptable to you that people behave toward you in that way, why would you go and behave to other pe toward other people that way? Give no offense. I don't care what people think. You should. You should not give offense. What our day and age have made that into is an all uh, an all-important rule give no offense I'm offended at that you see we've taken the second and the first commandment and we've switched it around don't take offense at the motorcycle rider he has the freedom not to be here he has the freedom not to be here right but he will have to give an account just like we will have to give an account, right? Pray for that man's soul. The third principle in Christian freedom is, it's their preference above mine. Verse 33, just as Paul is saying, just as I try to please everyone. Am I just called to be everyone's flutelop? To be everyone's dishcloth? To be the mat everyone can trod on? Yes, absolutely. That's what you've been called to. You have been called to lay aside your own preferences, your own likings, your own opinions, so that you may serve God more effectively. And your God wants you not to offend others. He wants you to please them. He doesn't want you to have anything get in the way of the gospel. You are called to be fruitful. You're called to bear fruit in the gospel. Be useful. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, here's the fourth principle, it's their advantage over mine. It's their advantage over mine. Not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Now here's a little bit of help here. Not seeking my own advantage, but that of many. What Paul is saying is, I'm trading my Christian freedom to be of advantage to as many people as possible. Don't turn it into, you need to give me advantage, not yourself. Because you're not tied to a single individual here by the grace of your God. 
your call to be of maximal impact to the maximum amount of people that you possibly can be. What does that mean? For me, as Henny van Nikak, what that would look like is, in everything I do not seek my own advantage, but that of many. What does that mean, that I'm going to give all the money in my bank account to Tashes? Because I'm seeking his advantage above my own? That would be foolish and stupid, wouldn't it? To be of advantage to Tashes, I need to love my wife and care for my family. Because if I don't do that, what, needs to ha what happens? The weight of the burden to care for widows and orphans rest with the rest of the main Christian men in the church. You see? So the mo moment I behave foolishly and I don't seek the advantage of my wife and my children, the burden is already on the rest of the congregation, on the men of the congregation in particular. Same thing goes for any of us. That's why we encourage one another and pray for one another. We're not Christians seeking to trip one another up all of the time because it puts a burden on us. When your Christian brothers and sisters fail, the burden is on you, Christian, to pick up where they have failed. So rather pray that they remain standing. Restore them. Restore them by addressing sin and sinful patterns. You're going to get yourself in trouble. I'm not saying this because I, it's lacquer. I'm saying this because I have a genuine concern. The Lord's going to discipline you and it's going to affect all of us. Seeking the advantage of others above my own, but it's the advantage of many that they may be saved. So in your Christian freedom, we've learned so far from Corinthians that Christian freedom is not an autonomous freedom without reference to God. It does not make you the God of all things free to do as you please, as you see fit. Your Christian freedom is a freedom from your past sins, your past brokenness, your past which you have sinned against God and have brought His condemnation upon you so that you now may love and serve Him and obey Him so that you will be useful. And so freedom here is for fruitfulness, fruitfulness in the gospel for the advantage of others. And then Paul closes the thought in chapter 11 and verse 1, be imitators of me as I am Im Im imitate Christ. What Paul is saying is just evaluate. Just evaluate me, Paul, he says. Am I doing what Christ did? Or am I doing something different? And if I'm doing the same thing Christ did, as He called me to follow Him, and He's called you to follow Him, Paul is saying, follow the leader. It's like that kid's game. What's the purpose of that kid's game? Follow the leader. The first one does this. And then the second one has to do this. Otherwise, the third one doesn't know he needs to do this. So if the first one does this and the second one does nothing, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, does nothing. This goes for churches. If a pastor doesn't, if his pastor is not faithful to follow the leader and do, then the rest of the congregation won't. If the husband in the home does not take leadership, does not take the responsibility to lead his family and show I'm following the leader and I do this and the rest of the family do this, if he doesn't do it, the family won't. And so Paul is saying your freedom is for fruitfulness. Your freedom is for fruitfulness, not for your own gain, your own purposes. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that Your Word is clear. Father, we 
as we have gone through this text where Paul had written to the Corinthian church, we can almost see his frustration. Well, these things do not need to be unnecessarily complicated. But we see that we complicate things when we turn service to our God into principles and rules and regulations divorced from our God. We thank you, O Lord, that you are faithful to continue to proclaim your word to us and to reveal yourself to us. We acknowledge that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything we receive, we receive with thanks. We also thank you for the special provision of the once for all sacrifice of Christ Jesus, our Lord, which we may now also celebrate in the Lord's Supper as we partake of the one bread and of the one cup. We pray that you would knit us together as we share the body and blood of Christ, our Lord. Father, there is no other worship and sacrifice that we acknowledge, that you acknowledge. You only accept the pleasing sacrifice of your own son, Jesus Christ. And he has fulfilled all things as he was raised from the dead, as the firstborn from the dead. And we will follow him in a death like his, but also in a life like his. And so, Lord, as we raise our eyes heavenward to where Christ is seated at the right hand of God on the throne of David, as he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, we pray that you would sustain us by your word and by the ordinances in the church which are visible signs of your sustaining grace to us. We pray that we might, may partake by faith and that our faith may be tested and be genuine. And so, Father, we pray that if there is any faith found amongst us, that that would encourage us, that we would come with boldness, not an arrogance, but a humble boldness and confidence to draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now stand as we make ready to receive the Lord's Supper. We sing together, Lord, thy word abideth. Hymn 262.
As we approach the Lord's Supper this morning, we are reminded that Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins. He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until His enemies should be made a footstool for His feet. For by a single offering He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer an offering for sins. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and the living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us pray together and bless the elements. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we may approach with confidence your throne of grace by the blood of Jesus and by his flesh that was broken. Father, we are reminded as we handle the elements this morning, as we take the bread and the cup, we are reminded that you would have required of the sinner to shed his own blood and his own body to be broken for the sins that he committed. And Father, we are deeply moved to think that the bread and the wine which represents the body and the blood of Christ Jesus is the body and the blood of an innocent man who had no sin. And so we confess before you, O Lord, there is no guilt and no sin found in him. The guilt and the shame and the sin is upon us. We thank you that by his substitutionary death he has taken our place so that we may stand before you as a righteous people. May we approach you with humility this morning as we handle the bread and the cup and as we partake by faith. Stir up in us a genuine and true faith, O Lord. Kindle in us and continue to stir up and kindle in us and fan a flame the faith that you have given to us. And so we believe, O Lord, help our unbelief, we pray. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We will now distribute the elements. Please take both the bread and the cup.